Hello everybody, I'm Miss Jessica from EVPL Central and we're here for our chapter book story time where we preview just a little bit of a chapter book so that you can decide if you would like to keep reading it. In the past, I have done a Plinko machine, I've done a wheel that I spun to decide what we are going to be reading next time, but my Plinko machine broke, my wheel that I used to have, I no longer have access to it. And so I'm just going to pick some books that I've always wanted to share with you and just haven't had the chance. So today we are going to be reading a very exciting book. It is called We Dream of Space. And this is by Erin Intrada Kelly. And this author is actually the same author that wrote Hello Universe and won the Newbery Medal for that book, which is a very, very distinguished honor that only one author gets um, for a chapter book for this age group. So that is amazing. Now, I will tell you before we start reading this, oh Lord, I feel so old because this is set in a time period that I was alive, I was a child, and it is considered historical fiction. And that makes me feel very old. So you might be able to guess about how old I am just based on that fact alone. So I'm gonna read the inside cover so we can see what this book is gonna be about. Meet the Nelson Thomas siblings of Park, Delaware. Cash, who loves basketball, but has a newly broken wrist, is in danger of failing seventh grade for the second time. Fitch, who spends every afternoon playing major havoc at the arcade and wrestles with an explosive temper he doesn't understand. Bird, Fitch's 12-year-old twin who wants to be NASA's first female shuttle commander, but feels like she's invisible. Cash, Fitch, and Bird live in the same house but exist in their own orbits, dreaming of hope, dreaming of belonging, dreaming of friendship, dreaming of family, and dreaming of space. Now, I will tell you, it doesn't talk about it in the description, but this book does center around a major, major event that happened in the 80s, and that has to do with the Challenger shuttle. And I actually don't remember this. Um, I was a little bit too young, but it is a very, very historical event. Um, I'm not going to talk about it on here, but it, it is something that you would like to learn about. Uh, do ask your grown-ups at home and see if they can talk to you about the Challenger shuttle and also um, what happened with that. Okay, so we're gonna start reading and I always love it when there's really fun things to kind of, um, lead up to the story. So we've got this really great shadow of them looking up in the sky. And then we also have a quote over here and it says, you have to dream, we all have to dream. And that is by Krista McAuliffe, mission specialist. And um, Krista McAuliffe was actually a teacher and she was on the Challenger shuttle. All right. Wednesday, January 1st, 1986 ready for takeoff. And this chapter is about Fitch and it does have a quick little illustration of him reading a book right there. The pinball machine didn't steal Fitch Thomas's quarter, not really. But when one of the flippers is broken, there's no point in playing. As soon as Fitch realized this, something sparked inside him, something ugly and familiar. He stared at the slot where he'd sunk his quarter only moments before easy does it, Fitch. Just go to Mr. Henley's office, get your quarterback. No big deal. The blinking lights of the machine, Bright Star One, it was called, seemed out of place in the arcade today. Fitch looked around. He was one of the only people there. Maybe it was too early for people. It was never too early for him. Ready for takeoff, the lights blazed. He left them behind and walked to Mr. Henley's office. The door with manager stenciled above the frame was opened, as usual. Mr. Henley was manager, owner, and staff. When quarters were stolen, he was the man to see. Fitch cleared his throat. <clears throat> Mr. Henley, he said. Mr. Henley looked up from his ledger. Henry Nelson Thomas, my favorite patron, what brings you to the front office? This was what Mr. Henley always said, even though no one called him Henry, and Mr. Henley's office was in the back corner of the small arcade, nowhere near the front. Fitch motioned half-heartedly toward the pinball row. One of the machines is broken, he said. 
Mr. Henley placed both hands on his desk and stood up like President Reagan, ready to face the Soviets. That is unacceptable, patron Thomas, he said. Mr. Henley was what Fitch's mother would call an odd duck, but he moved fast. Within seconds, he was in front of the major Havoc game in the center of the arcade squinting at the screen. Not that one, Fitch said. He pointed at Bright Star One. This one. Mr. Henley raised his eyebrows. But you're a major Havoc guy. One from all, all from one, fighting for your humanity and all that. Yes, it was true. On any given day, Fitch could be found at the Park Delaware Arcade, officially named the Pinball Wizard, but known to the locals as the Arcade on Main. Playing Major Havoc, a game that was his best friend, Vern Rapace, said, a Star Wars wannabe. Even though Major Havoc had been released first, but whatever. Vern was so obsessed with Star Wars that Fitch had developed unfounded resentment toward Luke, Han Solo, and the whole lot of them. Except Vader, maybe. Vader was kind of cool. The more Vern ragged on Major Havoc, the more dedicated and defensive Fitch became, and now he was so preoccupied with beating his own high score that Major Havoc in all his vector graphic glory sometimes appeared in his dreams, demanding that he get to the reactor before everyone exploded. But today was January 1st, and Fitch had made a New Year's resolution to try something different. The last time he was here, his twin sister had come along and been entranced by Bright Star One with its spaceships and lights. She didn't want to actually play it. Video games were not her thing, but she tried to convince him to give it a chance. He'd snapped at her to leave me alone, then felt bad about it later. So he'd gone for the pinball machine this morning, even though no one played pinball anymore. And now look what had happened. Mr. Henley made his way to Bright Star One and tapped it affectionately. What's wrong with it? He asked. The right flipper's broken, replied Fitch. Mr. Henley pushed the button. When nothing happened, he said, it's impossible to play a respectable game of pinball with just one flipper. Duh, Fitch thought. Mr. Henley disappeared into the office and emerged seconds later with a sheet of paper with out of order written across it in fat black letters. The smell of magic marker wafted in the air as he taped it across Bright Star One. Thanks for the heads up, Patron Thomas, Mr. Henley said. He smiled. It was wide and pleasant and took up most of his face. Anything else I can help you with? Yeah, you can give me my quarter, Fitch thought, but he didn't say it out loud. The fire was too bright. The mood of a house. All right, and this is Bird's chapter, and you can see a picture of her there. 10 seconds before Fitch's twin sister, Bernadette Nelson Thomas, opened her eyes, she thought, if there was a five on the alarm clock, it would be a good day. When the digital numbers glowed 2.32 p.m., no fives in sight, she assumed the first day of 1986 would be a toss-up. She shouldn't have slept so late, but she'd stayed awake until four that morning, assembling a new desk for her room. The job would have taken 30 minutes if she'd followed the instruction manual. But 12-year-old Bernadette, or Bird, as she was called, was not one to follow instruction manuals. She threw it away instead, assembled the desk perfectly, then created a manual of her own. Her stack of schematics was growing, and thanks to the new desk, she now had a safe place for them. After she forced herself out of bed, she walked quietly into the hall. Houses had their own personalities, and Bird liked to know which one she was walking into. She navigated around the hallway clutter, laundry baskets stuffed with clothes, short stacks of books and magazines, a box of old toys, including a Barbie that Bird had never played with, and her brother's plastic toolbox, which she had and listened as she sidestepped the seemingly endless array of sneakers that littered the house like landmines. Her mother always said, oh, sorry. Um, she would straighten up once she found a place for everything and where would that be? They were cramped enough as it was. Her parents didn't even have their own bedroom. They converted the small den into their personal space. That too was cluttered. Her parents were talking in low voices. That was a good sign. Bird continued into the living room where her father, Mike, was sitting in front of the entertainment center fiddling with the buttons on the new VCR. Her mother, Tammy, was stretched on the couch with a book saying, that was the whole point of getting a new one or so I thought. 
Burr detoured into the adjoining kitchen. She moved stained coffee mugs and random pieces of mail out of the way, then took out a bowl and spoon and placed them delicately on the kitchen counter. She stared at the cereal boxes in the pantry. She usually had apple jacks on Wednesdays, but maybe she should try something different. Fruity pebbles? No, those belong to Fitch. And he could really pitch a fit. Hence his nickname when someone messed with his things. Shredded wheat? No way! There was a fresh box of Frosted Flakes for cash, and he usually didn't notice if someone swiped his cereal, but Bird wasn't in a Frosted Flakes mood. That it wasn't the whole point, Tam, her father said. There are other people in this house, too. Applejacks, definitely Applejacks. Bird filled her cereal bowl three quarters full, then milk. I'm well aware there are other people in the house, Mike. Her mother replied, who do you think does all their laundry after working eight hours a day? Bird had misjudged the house's personality. She'd been tricked once again by her parents' low voices. She'd expected Dr. Jekyll, but it was Mr. Hyde. Good morning, Bird said, lifting her voice with as much enthusiasm as she could muster. Her mother looked up from her book. If tomorrow comes, it was called. Don't touch those sugar cereals, Bird. Those are for your brothers. You won't be skinny forever. I wonder how many times she'll say that sentence in 1986, Bird thought. She considered counting. Maybe we could make it a New Year's resolution. Bird returned the milk to the refrigerator. Where is everyone? Fitch is at the arcade and Cash is out with his friends, Tammy said. I stayed up late last night putting my desk together, said Bird. She shoved a spoonful of cereal into her mouth. It took me a while, but I got it. I even assembled the drawers and sketched a schematic of... It's probably not the VCR's fault, Tam, her father said. Eyes on the VCR. You probably didn't set it right. Okay, I'm going to pause really quick. Um, a VCR was a video cassette player, so kind of like a DVD player, but they had these um, big video cassettes and they were actually kind of about the size of a book and you would put them in there and it would play a movie. So very, very similar to a DVD, but just the technology before those. Her mother sighed and turned a page. I did exactly what the instructions told you to do, or it told me to do. If you did exactly what the instructions told you to do, it would have worked. Bird carried her bowl into the living room, moved a stack of newspapers off the armchair, and sat down. Their old VCR was on the carpet, a thin coat of dust and a tangle of wires on top. Bird had yet to disassemble a VCR. Now that would be a great undertaking to kick off the new year. She could remove the top of it easily with a simple screwdriver from her toolbox and take a bird's eye view of its inner working, study the guts of the machine machines had the best guts. If you don't need the old VCR, can I have it? Bird asked. Her question disappeared just as quickly as it arrived. Your father told me this new, this fancy new VCR would record days while I'm at work, her mother said. But today, when I sat down to watch my show, the tape was totally blank. Did it record a thing? What's happening with Dr. Evans these days? Bird asked quickly. Marlena Evans was her mother's favorite character on Days of Our Lives. Tam, which of these scenarios is more likely, her father said, leveling his eyes on her. He used his fingers to count off. One, our brand new VCR is malfunctioning for no apparent reason. Or two, you didn't get the settings right. Tammy laid the book face down on her lap. Oh, you're right, Michael. I'm far too stupid to follow clearly written instructions for a machine as complicated as this. No one said you were stupid. Bird chewed silently and focused on a speck of lint on the floor. <laughs> Sorry, Harper's over here chewing on some plastic. Harper, come here. Harper, can you not do that? Come here. Come here. Sorry. I'd have to be stupid if I can't read and follow simple instructions. We're all well aware of how smart you are. God forbid a woman with a college degree wouldn't know how to work a VCR. Tammy snatched the book off her lap and sat up. Lots of good that degree did me. I'm working as a secretary for a bunch of... You're the one who insisted on going back to school and putting us in debt. 
Bird's father flipped through the VCR manual. Funny you should talk about debt when you just spent an outrageous amount of money on a gadget that doesn't even work. Bird looked into her cereal bowl and thought of Miss Salonia, her science teacher. Before winter break, Mrs. Salonia and the class would said the, de the class would dedicate the month of January to space exploration to celebrate the launch of the Challenger shuttle. Mr. Miss Salonia had taught them all kinds of facts about space, not that Bird needed to be told. She knew many of them already, but the most fascinating fact was that there was no sound in space. Not really. Space is a vacuum, Miss Salonia said. If a piece of debris hits an orbiting spaceship, the astronauts inside would hear it, but someone outside wouldn't. As Miss Salonia explained the process of sound and molecules, Bird snapped a picture together in her head like a puzzle. Then she imagined her brothers and parents inside a spaceship and her outside floating in silence. And here is a picture. We have a bird's eye view of the video cassette recorder or VCR. And so that is what the inner workings look like. And so this right here is the VHS tape. So it would go in there and it would spin and play. And that's how you would watch movies back when I was a kid. All right, so we are now going to the next chapter, which is called God of Basketball. And this is Cash's chapter, and there is a picture of him. The game was pretty stupid to tell the truth. All you needed was a few guys and a brick wall. In this case, it was the east side of the Park Public Library, two blocks from the arcade on Main. And the guys were Cash Nelson Thomas, Justin Brant Brantley, and Kenny Haskins. The rules were simple. Two of them would run toward the wall, jump at the last minute, and touch the highest brick they could reach. The third guy would serve as judge to determine the victor. 13-year-old Cash was quick. He used to outrun Kenny and Brandt when they ran laps for Coach Farnsworth, so he usually got to the wall first. He wasn't much of a jumper, so he rarely won. It didn't matter anyway. There was no plot prize, only glory. On January 1st, Brandt and Kenny got to the parking lot before him typical. When they saw him appear down the street, hands stuffed in his Sixers jacket, Brant immediately called out, no wonder you're a repeat. Your butt can't get out of bed. Shut up, Cash said when he was close enough. The words came out casually but firmly as they always did, and he swallowed a thick seed of embarrassment as he always did. Brant and Kenny ragged on him any chance they got for failing seventh grade, but it's not like they were geniuses. Bird could outsmart them at any turn. Kenny had barely passed last year himself, but he had passed. Did you set off fireworks last night? Brant asked. A Boston Celtics knit cap covered his curly blonde hair. Cash resisted the urge to snatch it off his head. It's not Justin's fault his parents are from Boston. Cash's dad liked to say, all in good fun. We shot off a bunch of Roman candles, said Kenny. It was awesome. Kenny had red hair and pale skin. In elementary school, he cried because the kids called him Carrot Head. Now all the girls thought he was handsome. He was tall and more muscled than most of the other guys their age and was the star of the Park Middle basketball team, a spotlight he shared with Brandt. Cash had intended to be in the spotlight too, but things hadn't quite worked out that way. Yeah, Cash said, we fired a bunch. Actually, they'd only lit a few sparklers before Fitch got mad about something and stalked into the, his room. Their father went in after him because their mother had fallen asleep in the armchair at 11 o'clock, still wearing her pantyhose. Then it was all just Cash and Bird outside in the cold. And what did they have to talk about? Cash and Brant took their places a set distance from the wall while Kenny hung back to keep score. No one had to announce that it was time to start. They'd been best friends since elementary school and moved like a single unit. You gonna watch the game tonight? Asked Brant. What do you think? Cash replied. Portland's gonna get destroyed. The Sixers are gonna tank after Dr. J retires, Brant said. Enjoy it while it lasts. Dr. J, Julius Irving, forward of the Philadelphia 76ers, god of basketball. Dr. J was the last face Cash saw before he fell asleep and the first face he saw when he woke up thanks to a poster his dad got for him, which Cash had taped proudly to the back of his bedroom door. Are you guys gonna go or what? Kenny called. Cash took off without answering. 
Converse high tops hitting the, gra the cold gravel. He jumped as high as he could when he reached the wall, but he fell short, just as he always did. All right, so we're gonna stop there since we've got a chapter for each of the three siblings. And um, I, like I said, I really, really enjoy this book and it does revolve around a historical event and bless you, Harper. So if you are interested in continuing this, we do have copies at our locations. We also have it as an audiobook so you can play it on CD or we have it as an e-audiobook on Hoopla or an e-book on Hoopla. And one of the great things about Hoopla is that it doesn't matter how many people are reading it or listening to it, there's always a copy available. So I highly, highly recommend that you keep going with this book because it is a really, really good one. And I want to say, um, if you go to our homepage, evpl.org, you can see all the amazing events that we're doing, especially this summer. If you go to our YouTube page, EVPL Library, you can watch all of our different videos that we've got there. We've got some fun activities. We've got other chapter book story times with Miss Ellen and, sorry, I hiccuped, and Miss Rachel. And um, I really hope you enjoy what we're putting out there for you because we are very excited about these books and love to share them with you. All right, so I'm going to say goodbye for now, and I hope to see you next time. And so does Harper. Yeah. You want to see everybody next time? Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm Miss Jessica, and I'll see you soon. Bye.